Hi, my name's Matt Godbolt, and I'm going to tell you the five things you never realized your CPU did for you. Now, when I say CPU, I mean Intel CPU. A lot of the things I'm going to talk about apply to all modern CPUs, but the one I'm most familiar with is the Intel, and so this is what I'm going to talk about most. So the first thing you perhaps didn't realize your CPU does is it guesses how your data is accessed. Here's a simple loop that's accumulating the values, adding up a load of values in an array of integers. Necessarily, it's reading through memory in a sequential way, and you might reasonably expect that the first read is going to miss the cache and take a while to load from cache and um, bring in the data that you need. And then you're going to be able to add a bunch of numbers together in a loop until you hit the end of that cache line, and then you're going to miss the cache again. And that is indeed what will happen. But at this point, the CPU, or rather the cache hierarchy, starts to notice that there's a pattern to the misses that you, you're generating in your code. And it will actually go ahead and start pulling in cache lines ahead of you needing them. So it will prefetch the data automatically for you. This means that reading through memory sequentially in this predictable way means that the cache can often be ahead of your process without you even having to try. There's no need to do prefetching yourself. The data will be just magically in the cache for you already, which is amazing. The second thing your CPU does that you perhaps didn't realize is it turns CISC into RISC. Do you remember there was a big fight about whether CISC would win out or RISC would win out um, a few years ago, probably 10 years ago? Well, you may be writing x86 assembly, or rather you may be writing C or C++ or Java that gets turned into x86 assembly, and those instructions look like they are very CISC-y, but inside the chip they are turned into microcode, um, micro-operations, I should say, micro-operations. Those micro-operations are much, much simpler and are in fact much more like RISC. So here this first instruction, mov eax, comma 1, is pretty straightforward. It means put one into the register EAX. That will be one micro operation. However, the second instruction here, add RDI plus 16 comma one, is an increment of the integer pointed to by RDI plus 16. That's a very complicated operation. It's broken down into essentially four steps. And those four steps are the microcode uh, micro operations that go into the rest of the system. They can be independently scheduled and the dependencies between them are tracked um, separately, which means that the execution units inside your CPU can be used much more efficiently. Which leads us on to our third point. The order that you write your code is not the order that the CPU executes it. Take for example these six instructions. The first three read, add and write back some memory and the second three do the same again, but using different memory addresses and different registers. These th six instructions, two sets of three instructions, are essentially completely independent. If the read from RDI on the first line misses the cache, if the CPU just stalled right there, then several hundred CPU cycles would pass before anything interesting could happen. But because the second block is completely independent of the first, the CPU is at liberty to start executing those instructions while the first three are blocked waiting for the RDI read to complete. And perhaps our, the memory at RSI is in the cache. So the second set of three instructions can start running before even the first three have, have completed. This way we make much more efficient use of the resources inside the CPU, provided the CPU can prove that the two sequences of instructions, or the many sequences of instructions, are indeed independent. And here they of course are because they use completely different registers. But as you know, there aren't really that many registers in the x86, so um, this may lead to some problems. Except for the next point. The CPU converts, effectively, your code into static single assignment form. Now, if anyone's looked at compiler design, SSA is a really useful way of um, being able to prove about uh, optimizations that can be done on your code. Now, 
it's not strictly true that the inside of the x86 uses SSA, but it's a useful analogy. So what do I mean by this? Here is the same three set, uh, instructions using uh, the same three instructions as we saw in the previous slide, except that here they're sharing EAX. So in this case, we read into EAX, we add to EBX, and then we store it back out again. And then we read again into EAX and do an add and store back out. So these two blocks of code are no longer indistinguishable from each other. They're no longer independent of each other. That EAX is used in the first three instructions and in the second three instructions. So that means that our clever out of order execution trick doesn't work unless we rewrite it like this. Every time we write to a register, we give it a new name. That is, inside the chip, there are many, many more actual physical registers than there are architectural registers. So in the comments there, you can see that the EAX has been rewritten to be EAX0. This is not a real name. This is not actually how it's done, but this is a good demonstration. So on that first line, we're reading into a mythical register called EAX0, and we will never write to this register again. Instead, on the second line, when we're adding EBX to it, we're going to make up a new name for EAX. We're going to call this EAX1. And then we're going to assign that from the EAX0 plus EBX. And then on the third line, we're going to just store out to memory the EAX1 that we calculated in the previous step. Now, when we come to look at the next three instructions, because this version of EAX in the MOV EAX, RSI is completely independent of the previous result, we can just rewrite it as yet another name for EAX, EAX2, and so on. And so now, having rewritten these registers to be um, independently named, the out of order execution unit can now see that these three these two sets of three instructions are in fact independent and thus can be run in tandem. This means that this register renaming opens up an awful lot of instruction level parallelism. And do note that this is very different from the kind of parallelism you see when you use um, SSE instructions where you as a programmer go out of your way to pack multiple integers or floating point numbers together and get instructions to act on them together. This is instruction level parallelism extracted from the sequence of just normal regular instructions one after another. And so the last thing that you perhaps didn't realize your CPU does for you is predict the future. What do I mean by this? Well all those great out of order execution processes work really well when there are many many instructions that can be looked at and interdependencies removed and run in arbitrary orders. When does this break down? Well, it breaks down when you have to make a decision, such as a jump, a conditional branch. In this instance, this loop here is uh, going round in circles, adding, accumulating, um, as before, and um, it doesn't matter really what we do, that add the uh, add RDI and the comparison, and then the jump can all be scheduled together in clever ways, which is great, but unless we know whether the jump is taken or not, we can't see whether or not the next thing to do is the instruction after the jump, if not equal, or the add again at the top of the loop. This means that without some clever tricks, we're not going to be able to extract any more parallelism than running those three instructions together. Well, thankfully, we have the branch predictor. The branch predictor runs on every conditional branch and it makes a guess, an intelligent guess about whether or not that branch is going to be taken or not. And then it just assumes that the, its prediction is correct and the processor's out of order execution model will follow the prediction. And so in this instance here, we've got two loops run round um, as, as if the loop has been unrolled. And so um, any kind of parallelism that can be extracted from the instructions here can run. And again, I've rewritten these things as uh, EAX1, EAX2, and you can see that as we go back round to the top of the loop, we rewrite EAX again. And so now that second add can run in parallel with the first add if needs be. Of course, the processor may get this wrong, and so it has to flag instructions as being speculatively executed. And if the branch, um, once it's actually resolved, is found to have been mispredicted, that is the processor guessed incorrectly, then 
the, res the intermediate results of those uh, instructions that were speculated needs to be thrown away and the process restarted after, at, the, at the real destination of the jump. Well, in summary, your processor behind your back prefetches data for you, it converts your complicated instructions into microcode, it then reorders those microcode instructions uh, I should say microops. I keep saying microcode. I'm sorry. Micro operations. It then reorders those micro operations such to, to to take the most advantage of all of the execution resources on the chip. In order to enhance the out of order execution, it renames registers. So using the same register over and over again is not a barrier to out of order execution. And then finally, it will predict as best as it can whether or not branches are taken or not and their destinations in order to extract yet more parallelism. If you have any questions I'd be happy for you to email me or visit my blog. Uh, these slides are online if you want to look at them I'll put them in the notes. If you like this please subscribe and like.